Okay, everybody, uh, good afternoon. I uh, am Tabitha Hochscheid, and my role in this process is I am the uh, chair of the Health and Wellbeing Committee here at um, the Bar Association, and I helped found the committee. Uh, we've been around over five years. Uh, our goal is to help lawyers live a more balanced life, uh, to help lawyers, not only lawyers in crisis, uh, and work with OLAP, but to also uh, give lawyers information about stress, well-being, and if you haven't noticed, and um, get the CBA report every month. There are articles monthly, usually, from our committee. I think we've missed one month in five years. So uh, we get different people to write articles, people outside the legal community and inside the community. This last year, we had a whole series of articles on stress and how um, stress impacts you and how different lawyers handle stress differently. Um, next year, our committee is starting a quarterly, um, in conjunction with our regular monthly meeting, we're doing like a quarterly mini session with different um, practitioners. In February, we have Roz Flores from Domestic Relations Court. She's gonna come and talk about uh, domestic relations and the stresses that are in the job and uh, how they try to counteract that within um, the court. So uh, we hope you guys could take advantage of those quarterly um, how-to type sessions with the actual committee meetings. We also do the balanced living lectures. We do three to four a year. Um, I'll get to today's speaker in a minute, but our, our January 26th um, lecture is by Walter Smithson who is um, a psychologist who is coming to talk to us about positive stress and how stress can be a performance driver, but how if there's too much stress, um, it can be a negative. So I would like, if anybody would uh, like more information about that, you can see me afterwards. Also we have a, in front of you, the yellow sheet is an evaluation. We are planning our lectures for next year. If you have some topic that you think would be good, we would encourage you to make a suggestion. We get lots of uh, suggestions on sleep, um, on nutrition, those types of issues. Most of the lectures are uh, archived on YouTube, on the CBA's YouTube channel. You can go to our committee's uh, webpage uh, on the CBA's uh, master webpage and all the links are there. So there are a lot of topics there over the last five years that we've uh, delved into. But today's topic is kind of near and dear to me. Five years ago, actually, this month, I made the decision to strike out on my own and become a solo lawyer to start my own firm. I had spent uh, 15 years working in law firms, and I just could not find the fit for me, so I decided to make my own fit. And there are 50% of us, pretty much, are solo lawyers. So today's topic is how to find your fit, how to find what's best for you. I can tell you now, after five years, I feel like I made the overall best decision for my career that I could have made. Um, there are a lot of people after five, seven, ten years who end up at a firm or in an office, that situation where they're just not happy, but yet we oftentimes lack the courage to like, take that next step. So today's speaker is Sean Mangan. He's a professor at UC Law School. We gave this lecture a few weeks ago to law students and it was well received and they had lots of questions. I think Sean has a very good personal story about how he came to be a teacher, how he found what fit him the best um, as a lawyer. And I'm gonna just turn it over to him and let him uh, take it from there. Thank you, Tabitha. Um, so this, topic is probably more geared towards law students um, and it was really just kind of came out of a conversation that I had with Tabitha and some other people just about um, what do I, what are the conversations I end up having with people um, and so I don't know how much it'll fit for practicing attorneys I know uh, some of you are uh, former students I know and um, so that, that aren't too far into your career, so hopefully uh, it's helpful to you. Um, and I guess it's one of those things where um, I ended up in a certain place teaching law at UC, um, and a, 
I had lunch one day with uh, Beth Naylor at Frost Brown Todd, and she said, how did you end up like in this place? This is great. And, and I, I hadn't really thought about it until she said that. Um, and I guess I always thought my own story was I would just keep it to myself because it's mine and other people have things figured out and no one stumbles along like me. And then um, as I've been a professor, I get, I get the chance to meet all the students, get to know them. And because I teach transactional practical skills, like how to be uh, a lawyer in real life, that's, that's my job at UC is to teach that part. Um, I know I interact with attorneys all the time. And so um, I keep seeing the same themes come up over and over again. And they resonated so much with my own journey that I began to kind of think like, OK, maybe there's something here that isn't, maybe it wasn't just me. Um, and so I guess the, the purpose, or one thing I, I hope that you take out of this is, um, I think for each person is, do I at least have some intentional process that I use to evaluate what I'm doing and why? And that's, that's what I try to push the students on the most is, what are you trying to do? What are you thinking about every day? Or are you just applying for jobs hoping one hits? Um, and that's, that intentional process is, is what we're trying to do. And what I gave you, I guess, is a little bit of a framework of kind of, um, these are, this isn't necessarily a guide. This isn't, I'm no expert in career development. I haven't read, you know, I'm not published in the Harvard Business Review as to how to find your calling or anything. This is just, these are the topics that come up over and over again in the conversations I have with students. And then I guess because of, uh, I've been at UC for seven years now, so a lot of, um, I just know a lot of people that are between five and 15 years out, I guess. Um, and boy, between years seven and 10, a lot of people change. They either leave the law together, they make a big change. I, so I end up having lots of conversations with people in that seven to 10 range. Um, and my hope with the law students is they do it in law school. They ask these questions in law school so that they make good decisions at the outset, not necessarily get somewhere, find out they're not happy, and then have to change back. So, um, uh, and Tabitha kind of made reference uh, to my career, which I'll shorten for you all, but um, I grew up here in Cincinnati, went to Moeller High School. Um, I didn't want to be a priest, uh, which would have made me the absolute number one in my family. Um, I did the second best thing, which is to go to Notre Dame and join the Marine Corps. Those, <laughs> those are the two things in my family that were like, if you do that, we're, that's awesome. So uh, I went to Notre Dame, and I joined the Marine Corps. And that's kind of, I never really thought beyond that, because that's all I had thought about since I was like eight, was that. And so, um, and when it was time to uh, get out of the military, I, had, I didn't know what to do. I had an opportunity to stay in the military. I had an opportunity to come back here uh, and teach at Moeller. Um, and I had the chance to go to law school. And I really um, I felt very much like I wanted to teach. I had wanted to teach when I was in high school. And I just felt like if I'm teaching, I'll miss what's going on out there. Everybody's out doing stuff, driving around, like making things happen. I, I want to know what's going on out there. Um, and so I didn't teach. I, I followed that path, went into military, and then I had a chance to go back and teach, and um, I didn't. I got into law school, and I got into Virginia Law School, which was by, they had no business admitting me, and it was by far the best law school that I applied to or got into. Um, I was shocked, and uh, my brother, some of you may know my brother, who's an attorney, uh, and he's older than me, and he said, you know, it's a great school. I think you should go. You know, it's a great opportunity. You know, maybe you should go. So I went to law school. And I never once in law school thought about different career options. I thought you become a lawyer to stand up and argue. And that's what you do. So I did everything litigation oriented. Um, I did my summer internships, one here with Frost and a uh, second one in DC with a big firm. And I went to a big firm in DC. 
to do litigation. I just, it never occurred to me that you would do anything else. Um, and then moved back here uh, shortly thereafter, not that long, it wasn't in DC very long. Came back here to Frost and did big firm litigation. Um, the problem was it was really bad at it, <laughs> really bad at it, and I didn't like it at all. And so both those things kind of showed up. And so it took me a while to kind of look around and see, okay, this isn't really working. Um, so I need to find something else. And so um, I did a little research and I, I decided ERISA would be a great thing for me to practice. And to be honest with you, the biggest thing that hit me was whenever I look for new jobs, everyone's always advertising for ERISA attorneys. So I'm like, oh my, I, that, that must be some pretty good job security there. So I researched it a little bit and I thought, I've done labor and employment, I can do ERISA, it's employee benefits, they're related, not knowing they have no, absolutely nothing in common. And so um, it was really difficult to convince people, hey, I've been a lawyer for three years, I've been at two firms, and yet I want you to hire me to teach me something that I had, don't know and don't even know about and never took a single tax class in law school. Unfortunately, uh, Mark Stiebel um, took pity on me and hired me and taught me ERISA and I became an ERISA attorney. Uh, not really understanding how much tax it was, how different my day was now going to be. Um, we spent a lot of time studying tax and regulations and quiet days, frankly, a lot of them just studying and I loved it. I loved it. I loved every minute of it and I thought this is perfect for me. Uh, and I, ne I had never even considered any of those things. Like, I would prefer to sit there and get a complex tax problem, and if it takes two weeks, it takes two weeks. Uh, I found tremendous joy in that. I was very happy. Um, uh, and then eventually, after uh, uh, I think seven years with Mark, one of our clients in Pittsburgh offered me a job um, as the in house running their uh, HR department, and I took the job for money. Okay. Uh, they offered me a substantial raise, and I thought, this is great, this is my chance, and I took it. And commuted to Pittsburgh every week for um, a long time, <laughs> and realized um, I don't like Pittsburgh <laughs> at all. <laughs> I um, missed um, being a lawyer a lot, and my company was going to be sold. And so I thought, here we are, we're going to move our whole family to Pittsburgh for this job that's not going to exist in two years. And so that's when I began looking around. And at that exact moment, UC placed an ad that said, we are looking for somebody about 10 years out who knows estate planning, tax, and corporate law and can teach people how to draft contracts. And, I, and the job description basically hit my career perfectly. And I applied and got the position. And, um, and what I've found at UC is I'm a teacher. That's, that's who I am. And if I had lost my job at UC, I wouldn't call you all looking for a job as a lawyer. I'd call Cincinnati Public Schools looking for a teaching job. Like that's, I, I can't change it. That's what I like to do. And so, um, so I just kind of, I don't know, I never really told anybody that's, that whole story. I just lived my life, you know. I never really gave much thought to it. And then, um, as a professor, just kept having the same conversation with people all the time that touched on all these themes. And one thing I, I feel like is we make the decision to go to law school or we're taught to go to law school or we're a liberal arts major and we don't have a job until we go to law school, whatever. We end up in law school and it's kind of like, oh, I've made my career choice. I'm going to be an attorney. And yet, now I have this huge range of options to consider. And I just feel like sometimes they weren't intentionally considering the differences between being an ERISA attorney to being a solo practitioner, to doing litigation, to doing criminal work, to being in-house. Um, and now it's with the change in the way we deliver legal services, there is even more opportunities out there. So we place a lot of students each year on compliance jobs or non-traditional JD uh, positions. Um, and so they have even more, okay? They have more coming in. And one of the things that, you know, whenever a student hands in a contract that they, they, they don't get a good grade and they'll come in and they kind of argue, well, I, didn't, I, didn't, I couldn't find a good template. And I always remind them, like, 
you have more resources than any attorney in the history of the world before you, right? I mean, you have, you know, the framers had the Magna Carta. You have Lexis, Westlaw, you have a million templates, right? Like, that's not a good excuse at this point. Same thing with the jobs, right? They have tons of tools to search, you have tons of things coming in, um, and yet they feel a little bit almost overwhelmed by all that. Um, and so I kind of began to think, okay, well, I'll try to help students a little bit with their job search, and my own kind of experience would be helpful to them. Uh, and then I just ended up having more and more conversations with attorneys that hit along the same themes. Um, and not necessarily that they were unhappy with where they were, but that they hadn't really thought much about how they got to where they were, or where they wanted to be, or whether or not it was the right fit. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, client pressures, family, job, right? People get very busy. And I'm not sure we're necessarily wired to kind of stop and look at some of these things. And so, um, so this is really just a description of conversations I have with people, questions I'd like to ask students. Um, and I've just seen it kind of work a little bit in terms of helping people figure out um, maybe what's right for them. Um, and so the first thing that I try to hit is uh, the traps that I think you can fall into either in looking for a career, looking for kind of what you want to do. Um, and the traps fall into three categories, um, expectations, reliance, and focus. And expectations um, simply means uh, you, it could be your culture, it could be your family, it could be your peers, or it could be yourself. But are there expectations influencing what you are doing or what you are trying to do? Okay. You know, my family expects me to be this. My family expects me to do this. So one of my closest friends in law school, um, before law school, he was a fly fishing guide in North Carolina. Okay. And he did that for a couple years in the mountains and fly fishing guide. And his parents were basically like, completely disappointed in him <laughs> that he was a fly fishing guide in North Carolina. Um, and they said, you have, to, you have to grow up. Like, you have to go to school. You have to go to grad school. And, uh, and he didn't know if he wanted to be a doctor, doctor or a lawyer. He uh, was admitted to Harvard Med School and Harvard Law School, just to give you an idea of his um, abilities. And he ended up going to Virginia Law. Uh, and he spent his whole career in Silicon Valley. Um, working with, like, doing basically uh, venture cap stuff. Uh, had a great career. And yet, he's now ended up, he, now he works in Utah for a company called uh, Backcountry.com. And he moved to Utah solely to fly fish. You know, he's like, I, I'm working, I'm selling outdoor gear, and I'm working, I'm fly fishing, you know. And so it's just interesting to me, like, he's had a great career, very happy being an attorney. But he was at law school driven primarily by expectations. And so, and I, I find that a lot of the students have expectations that are influencing them. And I find that when I look back, I was influenced by expectations. And I don't want to suggest that those are negative things in a lot of ways. I worked hard to get into Notre Dame. I worked a lot harder in high school because I wanted that goal, right? I mean, it probably influenced me in a positive way. Um, and it was a great experience, and I don't regret anything I've ever done. But yet, when I look back, I'm not sure how much of it was me and how much of it was the influence. Was I being influenced to some extent? Um, and so that's something I, I tried to uh, uncover a little bit. Okay. Um, and I think a, a primary one of those sometimes can be um, Kind of either family or culture are the two that I see the most with students. Either my family expects me to do this, or culturally I'm supposed to do that. And I find it interesting that uh, we have a number of first gen students, meaning people that they're the first generation to go to college. And so at UC, that's a big part of UC. We have a house for just first gen students. Um, and then, so every year we have a few law students that are first gen. So they're the first people in their family to even get a college degree, and now they're in law school. Um, and they're, it's, they're some of my favorite people to talk to because they're very unencumbered by a lot of other things. They're the pioneers and their family, and so they're very open to lots of things. And it just, it's always struck me how they don't, they're, they're almost not as um, 
they're more open to different things. Um, another trap, I think, is reliance, meaning, and this is more for the students, but I guess if you're a practicing attorney, it might have some, some application to you, which is, um, what am I relying on to guide my career or get, find my place in the law? Um, and for the students, you know, what I try to put, push back on them is they're relying on the school to do that. It's the school's job to find me a job, which isn't true. And so one of the things I always try to remind them of is nobody really cares about your career, like deep down, right? Like if you're a summer associate and you're, you know, you work all summer, you guys have fun together, but the person next to you doesn't get an offer and you do, I mean, you feel bad for a little bit, right? But like a year later, are you, you know, you're not invested. You're not invested. That was their career, yours. And so um, I do think there's an ownership that has to come about to some extent. Um, and I, frankly, I never felt like I had it until I'd been at UC, where it's like, okay, now I'm, this is my career and I'm owning it. The rest of it, I felt like I was just kind of going along on a stream, and if things didn't work out, it was other people's fault, you know? And that, that I think I just kind of let that, let that happen. Um, and I think we can rely a little bit on other people to do those things, too. Uh, other people will help me do this, or others should offer me this position, or whatever it may be. Um, and I think sometimes we just rely on, at least for the students, either chance or whatever my first job is, that's what it'll be. Okay? If I get this job, that's, I'm just going to go into that. Okay? Um, and I really try to push back on them a little bit. Okay? Um, which, um, you know, sometimes we have students that, oh, I'm going to a big firm or whatever, and I just know they're not going to be there for very long. You know, just, I just know them and I'd say, you know, call me in a couple years when you're going to transition. And they're like, oh, it never happened. It happens. <laughs> you know, you can, just, you can just see it. And so um, I think sometimes there's too much reliance on that. Oh, if I get this position, then that'll kind of guide me along. Um, and then I think the third trap we fall into is what are we focused on? Okay. Is it money, status, reputation, a, a particular label? Okay. And sometimes this gets a little uncomfortable, I guess, right? When we start to talk about, we don't really want to talk about money necessarily or anything like that or the reputation of a firm or anything like that, but I think it's an influencer. It's a trap that we can fall into. I have spent this much, I, or I should make this much, or whatever it may be. Um, and so what I try to do is separate the career decision-making process from these traps. Okay? And it's very difficult, I think, to do. But let's try to remove our thoughts about money and reputation and our family's culture and what we think the school owes us, and let's just try to figure out where the best fit is. Um, and so that, to me, I think that's probably the first step in any job search or anything is to almost um, deconstruct whatever your programming is or whatever some things are that might be influencing you that I think go unseen a lot of times. It certainly went unseen for me for 20 years. And so I just think sometimes we even, it may not be that you have to take away those things, it just acknowledge them. If, even if I know they're there, uh, that, that could be helpful. And then, um, so those are traps I think you can fall into. And, and then I try to um, do a couple things. And really what my goal is, is to marry a student's personality and abilities with the correct practice area and practice setting. That's where I think, that's what I'm trying to get a student to do. Um, and I think, and, and at first, that again, my own experience when I go back, Terrible litigator, okay? Not really that competitive. And I, um, you know, uh, Dave Skidmore was one of the first people I worked at at Frost, and he's still a dear friend of mine who's awesome to me. And we did a motions hearing once, and he let me argue the motion, and we lost. And we were walking back to the office, and he was like, that, that really wasn't that good. And I was like, Dave, like, we shouldn't have won. Like, we don't have a good argument, you know? <laughs> and he's looking at me like, you're a litigator. Like, you're supposed to argue. And I was kind of like, man, we, you know, we'll be fine. Like, I just didn't, I, w I just wasn't that invested. I was kind of like, eh, you know, we didn't have a good argument. You win some, you lose some. And I don't, you're not going to be very good in that field if you're like that. Um, 
I learned that the hard way, right? So, uh, so one of the things I try to get people to do is is kind of look at yourself. What 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 are you in? What do you enjoy? What are you good at? Those kinds of things. Um, and so I've kind of, and I've given you a handout with a little, some questions, but some of the questions I ask students are what, are, what are the things that they're afraid of? What are the things that they either try to control or like to control? Um, and sometimes that gets, um, you know, could, that sometimes maybe gets deeper than I'm certainly qualified to handle. Um, but I've been surprised at how much is fear driven. Um, in terms of what they're going to do or what they think they should do. Um, and so that to me is something that I try to, to keep in mind. And it's interesting to me, you know, people give you like little sayings or you see little sayings all the time, you know, and I just, I pretty much ignore uh, all of them. But the only one I've ever kept, my sister gave me, which said, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? And I thought that, I don't know. <laughs> Because I've always been so afraid to fail, right? So I don't, I didn't, it bothered me. I didn't know the answer to that question. And so I think that's one thing that as a student tries to kind of examine um, themselves first, that those are some things to consider. Um, and then I try to focus on what, what are they energized by and what are they not energized by? Um, and so, um, you know, I think what I do for a living would be very boring to a lot of people, but to me it's energizing. I enjoy it. Reading Arissa energized me. I enjoy. I could sit there all day long and do the work, and it never bothered me at all. Um, but if I and I can stand up here and speak until I'll go till five if you want, Tabitha. It doesn't bother me at all. Okay. But if we were all, all of us weren't here for this CLE, and I wasn't able to sit behind the podium, if we were just here for a meet and greet. 45 minutes, I am exhausted. I have absolutely wiped. Because that, for me, is difficult. That kind of interaction is really hard for me. And it exhausts me. And so one of the things I try to focus that with the students on is, is, is your work energizing you or is it taking energy from you? Because I think, and what I learned uh, in big firm litigate, you cannot fake it forever. You, you Just from a mental, emotional standpoint, but other people know too. They know you're not that good at it because they know you don't enjoy it. Um, and so that's one of the things I think is, is we try to get some the students some exposure to different legal things to see what's giving you energy and what's not. Whether it's the subject area of the law or the setting, is it talking to a client, is it standing up in court, is it you know doing anything like that. Are you accepting questions now or at the end? Oh, sure. sure. Go ahead. Uh, what, uh, other than self-examination and perhaps informational interviewing, do you uh, direct the student to or the uh, litigator to or the person who's already in the practice in terms of evaluation and assessment? What role does that place in your counseling? So what I do is not at all structured sanctioned, endorsed, or anything, okay? I just teach, and these are a conversation I've had. UC has uh, a specific program for that. So they use strength assessments, which is used by a number of universities, where you um, take it at the beginning of your uh, tenure at the school, and then you come back and you look at it each year when you come back. You don't retake it, but you come back after each year to go back through your strengths. Uh, it's called Strengths Finder, and it's used by uh, a number of institutions. Um, and that, at least in terms of evaluation, is kind of the formal part of it. Um, one gap in that is, I, and I do think it's helpful, and there's, um, there's a book out, there's a, a really good book called Strengths Finders 2.0, who's the, um, uh, the psychologist that started Strength Finders has a kind of a second version of it that's really helpful. Um, that's a kind of our formal process. What I don't think we do very well on the formal side is exposure to different types of law. Like, what are you going to do every day, <laughs> right? That, like, that's, that's what I think we could probably formalize better. 
you know, I mean, the best thing that I try to get them to do is either is through the CBA. If you want to know what the health care, what it's like to be a health care lawyer, go to the health care law meetings and get to meet health care lawyers and see what they talk about and do every day. I think we could probably do better than that because right now it's either between my classes and my internships and jobs, that's how I get exposed to the law. Not sure that's the best way to do it. So yeah, so in terms of the formal assessments, that's what we have. Um, and I believe, there, I think there's more at the university. There's more, you can do further assessments if you want, but that's the one that we do at the law school. Does that, does that answer it? Okay. Um, and then I think internally too is asking yourself, do you like rules or do you like the ambiguity? Do you like, I liked reading the Internal Revenue Code because I could find an answer. And yeah, there's gray area and there's tax law, but between the tax code and the regulations and everything else, I found it far better than in litigation making an argument. I didn't like the ambiguity. I didn't feel very comfortable citing a case in a memo. I would shepherdize. It just keeps, I'm like convinced that there's some other case that I missed that totally usurps mine and the other side's going to find, right? It just bothered me. And I found far more comfort doing contracts, corporate law, tax. Just felt, I just felt better. And so um, with all these things, it, I really I feel like you can't put a value on these necessarily in terms of one's good and one's bad. It's just what do you, what, what do, you do better with? Um, and then I think I try to, you know, again, are you, do you like research? Do you like to read? Do you like to write? Do you like public speaking? Are you better off one-on-one -on -one conversations or group settings? Just some of those things to kind of see. Because I don't think going into a career where I'm constantly going to be put in a setting I'm not good at is a recipe for a successful career. I just don't think that's a smart way to do it. Um, and so we try, to, we try to flush some of those things out. Okay? And I'm sure those of you who work in a firm, right, you can kind of look at, um, do you like to eat lunch at your desk? Or do you go to eat lunch with your colleagues? Or would you like to go to eat lunch with a client prospect or something like that? And we probably all do all of them to some extent. Okay, but which one do you most look forward to, <laughs> right? Um, and I think sometimes that can kind of help me figure out, should I be in, you know, this kind of area? Or this, am I going to excel at client development? Or should I be somewhere where uh, my client development isn't contingent on, on that kind of interaction or, or whatever? Um, and so uh, one way I think to think about it is just in any client relationship, there's kind of the initial sale or the initial contact with the client, then the close of the sale when the, the client's engaged, and then afterwards maintaining the relationship with the client. And in most professional sales, you would have three different people that fill those three different roles. And the reason most professional sales do it that way is because those three different roles require three completely different skill sets and usually attract three different personalities. And so I try to push the students on that. Um, one of the things we're fortunate to have at UC is we have our own sales center at the business school, one of the few business schools in the country where you can actually major in sales. And the woman that runs it, her name is Jane Soika, has come over and done some sales training for our law students. And it's amazing um, how and she's really good at it. And it's amazing how quickly she gets some kind of grouped in these three categories. Um, and, and, the one, and some people, you may know people like this, they're really good lawyers, they're really good writers, they're comfortable in all settings, and they can do all three areas of the client relationship really well, right? I don't like people like that, but I know a lot of people like that, right? They're just good at everything they do. Um, but I don't think that's true for most. I think most people kind of gravitate towards one or the other. I was far better at taking an existing client relationship and expanding it than I was on the other two, okay? Which makes sense, I'm somewhat introverted. That made a lot of sense to me. And so um, some of the people I worked with, great personalities, very outgoing, enjoyed getting to meet new people and bringing them in, happy to pass off the maintenance of the relationship to me at that point. It just, it worked well. So I like to, I think it's, 
good for the students to at least think about that. Okay? Just think a little bit about what you, what you might be attracted to. Um, and then lastly, I try to push them on what is their relationship with certain things in life, like time, money, status, or the law. Right? We, have, we all have a relationship with these things. And so, um, and maybe we don't want one, right? It would be nice if I didn't have to worry about money or I didn't have to worry about what other people think of me or the status of my job or anything like that. But I don't think necessarily that's realistic. And so we have these things in life. We have a relationship with them. What does that relationship look like? What is the relationship with your career? How big is it in your life? Um, those are things, um, and then what is my relationship with stress? Right? What, are, how, what causes me stress? What takes away stress? Um, th these are, <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're best friends, yeah. So um, I just think those are, these are questions that I think help me or help anyone begin to at least intentionally think about things that you don't on a daily basis. And, and that's really the only point, is to try to get yourself out of the traps that we normally fall in in the day to day and kind of t step back and take a little bit of a look at these things. Um, and, um, you know, I, and to me I find that, that time, money, and stress are all related, obviously, right? I mean, I think most most people that work for you, they either want more money or they want more time off. Right? Those, those are, uh, and the purpose of either one is to lower their stress, right? So there's kind of this uh, relationship among those three that goes through. And so um, I think it's important to, to think about it. I met with a, a guy uh, a few weeks ago. Um, he's very young. He's maybe 21, 22. He's kind of in the startup world, uh, incredibly magnetic, um, incredibly intelligent person at his age, it's amazing. Uh, and he's like, well, here's, you know, I need to make this by age 30, and this is more than I'll ever uh, have, right? And he's like, well, that by 30, that's the goal. So we're doing everything to get, you know, I mean, he's got the whole thing laid out, and very financially oriented. And I thought, this is awesome, because he knows exactly, like, he's, he's, he's crystal clear about it. He's gone through all, he's thought everything out, this is what I want. And he's got very clearly articulated reasons for all of it. And I thought, that's good, <laughs> right? He's got clarity about it. So I think that's the point, okay? I think if you go through all this and you, and you say, well, I just want to make a lot of money. I'm going to go into whatever practice area helps me make a lot of money. Awesome, that's good that you know that, <laughs> right? So that's the part, that's the point, okay, is just to even think about it. What is my relationship with it? Um, and then we try to shift, and those are all kind of internal questions, because I think, um, uh, and, and I'll just pause right there just to mention a couple things. Um, I've been involved with the Health and Wellness Committee at, here at the Bar Association since Tabitha uh, started it. And, um, you know, what struck me the most is what happens with the mental health of uh, law students. Uh, and there hasn't been a ton of studies on this, but the ones that have been done, um, the entering population looks very much like the general population of the United States, about 9% that would be uh, considered to have depression or depression-like symptoms. By the time you graduate law school, that number's at 40%. By the end of the first year, that number's at 30 and so it happens very quickly in law school, the mental health um, assault, okay? There's an assault on mental health that happens. Um, and so I think asking these internal questions, trying to get to know yourself, even if someone comes in at 24, 25, they've done a lot of things in life, they're obviously an adult, and yet law school can almost kind of change a lot of that. And so I do think it's worth re-going through this process, like re-asking yourself these questions, at, particularly after your first year of law school. Um, because we don't have an historically good track record in the law of doing this, of teaching people how to be lawyers and preserving their mental health and placing them in positive uh, career choices right at the beginning, or at least intentional career choices. And so that's why I think the internal questions matter. It, 
it matters because I'm in this whole new world. It's taught me a whole new different way to think, and I need to figure out where I fit in it. And, and I think end of first year, beginning of second year is a good time to start asking some of those questions. Um, and so that's why I think that internal part is good because I think what we may know about ourselves entering law school can change. And it, it does change somewhat. Um, and then I try to get more externally focused with them in terms of um, what are the practice settings you would like to um, consider, uh, things like with a small firm versus a large firm, in-house versus private practice. Um, do people like variety in their work? Do they, how much do they like routine in their life versus unpredictability? Okay. Um, so if I'm in a plaintiff's litigation firm, right? The work is unpredictable. The income is unpredictable, right? Lots of going up and down. And a, one of my favorite things about ERISA is there very, there's very few emergencies in ERISA. <laughs> you know, no one ever calls like, hey, I got a 401k plan emergency. Like, come over here, right? It's not, it doesn't happen that way. And I love that, okay? I am a routine-oriented person. Not at all disciplined, just routine, you know? And so I like things to kind of just be the same all the time. It gives, it, whatever reason, it's comforting to me. And so I try to ask kind of the students of that because if you hate routine, right, and you work for somebody like me doing ERISA, you're not going to be happy. It's just not going to, the work is not going to be exciting for you at all, <laughs> right? And if you're like me and you don't, you're risk averse and you like routine, you know, being a plaintiff's attorney, probably not a great career choice. Not, that's not energy giving to me. And so that's, I think I try to uh, get students to consider that. One of the problems they have is they don't know enough about different areas of the law. They don't know enough about what practice is like. They certainly don't know enough about law firm economics and, and how to, you know, there's, there's, there's an economic component to all of this in terms of the how many clients we're going to bring in, what our business model is, and all that. And so I try to spend some time with that and to get exposure to that. Um, and um, trying to get them to consider some of these questions when they're looking at that. And one of the things that kind of helped kind of start this process for me was I teach contract drafting, which you take in second or third year. Uh, legal research and writing hasn't changed much from when any of us went to law school. It's very litigation oriented. And I had so many students after contract drafting say, you know, I always wanted to be a litigator. Now I'm thinking this might be more interesting. And it's because they learned like it's kind of, it can be fun to draft a contract. It can be fun to kind of figure out what your client wants and advocate within the contract. And so I just felt like, well, that shouldn't happen your third year or second semester. <laughs> That, that's not a good time for it to dawn on you that maybe you enjoy the transactional side. Um, and so I think we could probably do a little bit better on that, on getting exposure to that. Um, and I think uh, considering do, do you want to be an expert in something or do you want to be a generalist? Um, and I think that question in particular is more important with um, the younger generation because one of the things that I see with them is they process information very differently than I do or peers in my generation. Um, and what they can do that I can't do is they take multiple information from multiple sources at incredible speeds. Okay? When I'm teaching, they all have their laptop up. I am one of nine competing things for their attention, right? They have Snapchat, they got their message, right? Grant's in the back laughing, right? Yeah, so Grant was a former student. They have many things going on, right? And I'm competing, and I approach it as if I'm competing, right? I am trying to compete for their attention. Um, and they are very good at taking all this diffuse information, quickly synthesizing it, and seeing the relationships between all that information. What they aren't really good at doing is having, like my former boss, Mark Stiebel, walk into their office and say, Hi, here's an interesting tax question. I need to know the answer. And it's probably going to take you three weeks to find the answer because it's that complex. And there's my life for the next three weeks, right? They don't want that. <laughs> they struggle with that. Whenever they get something where you basically have to go really deep on one single thing, it's harder for them, okay? And so I try to 
focus a little bit with them. Do you want to be a generalist or, or a, an expert? What, do you enjoy the process of gaining expertise? Or do you not? You know, what, what, what appeals to you on, on that? And so um, I think that's a good, um, that one, I didn't intentionally kind of set out to talk to people about that, but it, it turns out that comes up a lot, particularly with people that have been practicing for a while. Um, I see this sometimes with litigators. They're like, you know, I've been out for seven years. I've done some cool cases, but I don't really know anything. Like, I'm, I know how to litigate, but I don't know um, anything else. And so um, they, they're kind of wanting to get an expertise in something. Um, and then I think the last thing I try to focus on, or at least ask people, is what is your career to you? Is it a means to an end? Does it need to serve some larger purpose in life? Does, it have, does what you do for a career have to be in line with what you see as your, your life purpose, or is that outside of work? Is your career kind of more of a means to what, you know, the life you're trying to provide your family, or the lifestyle that you are trying to provide yourself? Um, and, you know, is service to the clients enough, or are you trying to accomplish more? And so, um, and I think that is an interesting question, particularly with the younger generation as well, where they um, absolutely have kind of more of a mission orientation to everything that they are doing. Um, this exposure to multiple sources of information, they're just better, they were better consumers in terms of choosing law school and everything that they've done, far better than I was. They had more information, they use it better. Um, and they have more of a commitment to integrating what they believe in with their regular life and their career. And so that sometimes can run against cultural expectations, my relationship with money, right, firm economics, <laughs> right? And so um, I like to push them on that because if, um, if the economic realities make that not an option, then we need to know that. Or if you truly don't care about money, but you want to pursue something, okay? I talked to a student this week. She's got absolutely clarity as to what she wants to do with her life, with her law degree. And it's not going to pay well at all. <laughs> There's no part of that career path where you could make a lot of money. And She's on board. She's actually ordered her whole life for that, okay, to be able to economically do this. And so I think that's great because she's not just going into it. She's not blind either way, right? That's where too many, I think, too often we get, we just don't, we want to do this, but we don't deal with the realities. And so I just think it's something to ask a question. And I think one of the, I guess, maybe the adjustment for practicing lawyers would be, um, you know, we all get accustomed to certain lifestyles, right? You kind of move up a little bit, maybe over time. You get accustomed to the lifestyle or you get accustomed to certain things. It becomes more and more difficult to change, right? It's very difficult for any company to reinvent itself, right? Um, you know, Sears, right? You see all the retailers right now, you know? They're like, how do we reinvent in the age of Amazon? It's not as if Amazon started yesterday. <laughs> They've had some headwinds that this is coming, and yet it's so hard to reinvent your own business model. And so I think as hard as that is for companies, it's equally as hard for individuals. Um, so that's just, that's kind of it. That's the, the spiel. And what, I'm, what I think the ultimate goal is to try to get, um, when I talk to students, it's trying to match what they love to do, what matters to them, and what they are naturally good at with areas of the law that feed into that and compensate that, okay? Where you will get paid for what you are already good at or naturally drawn to. Um, for those of you practicing attorneys, you may be like, well, I just, you know, none of this really applies to you, great, but what I would ask you is, when I send my law students out to meet you for coffee or talk to you on the phone, ask them some of these questions or try to push them on some of this stuff because you may be comfortable in where you are, but I, I see a lot that aren't, at least when they're first starting off. And I think 
if the conversation can kind of not just we're a good firm and what's your GPA, but here's what I do every day. Does this fit what you're good at? You know, that, that, I think there's more of that conversation out there. Any thoughts or questions or anything that anybody wants to share? Yeah. Well, I know you said a lot of brands <coughs> and, and talk to you. Mm -hmm. And you said, what did you say, like seven plus years you did a lot of Yeah. Work. I mean, I've only been there for seven years. But I end up, for, because of where I'm at, I just end up talking to lots of attorneys, uh, whether they went to UC or not. And when it goes into the career stuff, it seems to be very common at seven to 10 years that somebody's either considering a change or they've made a change or they're, you know, and somehow I get connected to them. Any, um... I don't get a lot of, 30-year attorneys calling me saying, you know, and really not that many, but it just seemed not, not that many three years out either. It just seems seven to 10 for whatever reason. So for someone who's, you know, in that range or already practicing, who might have a better idea of what different areas are like, are there any other suggestions you have for them? I mean, obviously, you've already said a lot of things that can be related, but have you watched any of those people you've talked to? Or, um, I've talked to people that have done that. Um, I wish there was a better answer as to, you know, I don't think there's many firms or companies that are, you know, maybe Procter & Gamble, how they try to move people around, but in general, that there's not much opportunity to work at a firm for eight years and then totally switch your practice here. But there are people that have done it in Cincinnati, and I have talked to, and I guess the only thing I would say is, all the people that I know that have done it, which aren't many, have been very intentional about it, first of all. They, they kind of went through some process to realize, I can't do what I'm doing for the next 20, 30 years. Um, and the ones that I'm thinking of, at least in my head, three or four, they didn't look for a new firm. They went to their existing firm and said, here's what I want to do. And the firm was very supportive. That's all I know on that one. Yeah. yeah. I would challenge existing lawyers to think about their clients in the same context that they're thinking about their career and that there are some clients that you just need to get rid of. I mean, I, I, I hate to say it that way, but the reality is sometimes the best thing you can do for your, for your practice and for your career is to realize that you're not matching up well with the person you're doing the work with. And there may be another lawyer within your firm that would match up better, or it may be just a situation where you're not going to ever get there. Mm -hmm. um, and since I started my own practice, I've made some conscious decisions about that. And my life is a lot less stressful because I haven't kept the ones that I didn't mesh well. And I just had to trust that something else would come out. Um, that's the biggest thing. You get into a situation where you have a large client, clients giving you a lot of work, mm -hmm. you know. And then you have to do the cost benefit. Is it worth right. all the aggravation? Most of the time it's not. Yeah. Yeah. I guess mine is more just a reflection of the question, but um, as a newer attorney and a solo practitioner, a lot of the Older solo practitioners who've been doing it for 20 years will constantly say, "You have to find your focus. You have to find your focus. You have to start to narrow down. You can't take any case that comes in." And um, I just find my personality just fighting against that. If I don't know what I want to focus on, if it's a problem that I can solve, then I'm just taking mm -hmm. it in. But I just hear you talk about the younger, the law students. I think I'm not as young as many of the law students, but I think there is a difference in. Um, the younger attorneys to where you don't necessarily have to focus. But I'm, I'm fighting with that right now, so it was interesting to hear you talk about how you think that the students can take on many different things at one time, where I think the old school thought is for attorneys, it's like if you're doing domestic relations, you're doing just domestic relations. If you're doing criminal, you're just criminal. You know, everything is mm -hmm. just so cut and dry. Well, I, I will say that I think they can process lots of information from different sources quickly. 
they struggle with doing things at the level that many people expect. So, I'll, and I'll give you an example. When they hand in a contract, they're doing the same thing. They're, they're doing the assignment I've given them, and they have Stranger Things on Netflix, and they have something else going on, and they're chatting with like five different people, and their agreement is terrible. And they have half of the mistakes that are things that you should have learned by the sixth grade in terms of capitalizing and punctuation and stuff like that. And so that's, I try to attack that as much as I can. And they're like, oh, I can't believe there's mistakes in here. And I'm like, well, I can <laughs> because you're trying to do nine different things at one time. So they're very good at it, better than I am. But it's also hurts them in some other areas. And one of the things I think, for them at least, is trying to figure out when can I do a few things at one time and when can I not. No, no, no. I'm just clarifying what I was saying about the students. I mean, I don't know in your practice. I mean, one of the thi I just think one of the things that's interesting to me is, and I, I have a side practice. It's very small. But if um, I have a pretty limited range of stuff I feel good enough, comfortable enough doing. Um, whereas I know some attorneys would be like, yeah, I can figure that out. I'll be fine. You know, and so for me, like, it's, it's more about the confidence to do it than anything. And so I would say if you're confident, like, yeah, I can do this. I'm, or I'm interested in that. I want to learn it. I don't know that that's a bad thing. So you might see domestic relations attorney also doing wills and probate, and um, the criminal defense attorney might also do divorce law too. So they usually pick like a triumphant that just fits their personality and their their passions. I would say that you will naturally start moving out things that you don't want yeah. to do. I think for me, um, I've done an enormous amount of debt collection over the years, <clears throat> and there's some stuff I just won't do. Like, I don't want to purchase, I don't want to benefit the debt, I don't want to blah, 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 blah. And I have a certain niche client that I want it, and that's where I focus my attention because the other stuff does not get me up. Mm -hmm. I don't want to work for this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are things that you really enjoy doing, and then you try to find more of that. And then there are things that you have to do in order to keep your lights on and your solo. <coughs> you know, like I, I know a guy who does a lot of really good PI work, but it's not enough, so he does some divorce work on the junior work. So that's a lot of it too. What's steady income versus what is my grade? Yeah. <coughs> yes, uh, as a forensic psychologist who acts as a resource for OLA, it's been my experience for those uh, attorneys who have utilized that resource that they have lacked diversity. They have gotten married to the money and they have a difficult time uh, with other sources of empowerment, whether that be personal or family. Mm -hmm. And so then they crash. <clears throat> I think it's because they're not asking themselves the question Sean Say has. I, I think I don't that know. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that there are people who look at their job as who they are. And I think you see a lot of that is in the practice of law. Like if I'm not a lawyer, what am I going to be? Mm -hmm. And what Sean's saying is there are all these other options out there if you're a lawyer. You don't have to go be a lawyer. You don't have to go to a law firm. You can do a bunch of different things because our economy's changed. Our expectation of what people do is increased. Yeah, my thing with the students isn't I don't have any answers, but I just try to get them to ask questions that they should. I'm not sure they always ask the questions they should. That's really what I try to push them on is what questions should you be asking. I think I wish when, when I was at UC that they had your position and they had those strength finders and mm -hmm. um, 
that they let us know, and not to sound really negative, but like once you're in something, nobody ever wants to let you out. It's really hard to break out and reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. So whereas I naturally went into litigation, it's what I was born to do, mm -hmm. except that I couldn't eventually, with three kids, a full-time job, and, and a marriage, I couldn't take the contention mm -hmm. every day yeah. and the conflict and, um, you know, all but physical battle yeah. in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. So how do you get out of litigation? You had mentioned a, a, somebody you knew talking about, now I want to focus on something, but I don't know what. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Getting, I spent 17 years as a litigator before I found mm -hmm. somebody who would give me the opportunity to right. do something other than yeah. litigation. Mm -hmm. So now, and then I, because within the company I was at, I also had the opportunity to do something other than practice law. Mm -hmm. I think that's extremely rare. Yeah. And, and now I'm in a situation where I, I'll happily do HR or employment law, and you can't get anybody to give you another break, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's like they want to pigeonhole you, right. although you know you're still agile. Yeah, but I and that's why I think, I don't know, <clears throat> I'm not sure all of this is relevant after you've been a lawyer for a long time. I think maybe some of it is, but I do think it's a fundamentally different thing at that point. Yeah. But I just you know? think it's incredibly important that you reach those law students early, early on. They might have to do it for the rest of their lives. Well, well I mean. <laughs> you, don't know 20, and, you don't know at 21 when you start law school. Either. Well, and my point to them was it took me 20 years of adulthood to kind of find a job that where I'm like, oh, I'm like really happy. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you very much.